everyone thank you for joining us tonight um appreciate y'all being here um we are going to get started momentarily um i'm anthony elmo texas aft's political director um we are back in another uh political cycle so we're excited to talk about um politics tonight but also the levers of power and and government um and we're gonna go back and do a little civics 101 and try to help folks understand what is going on in this great state um, at the different levels uh, of government um, as we're approaching another election cycle, um, a presidential year, um, and uh, and coming out of the uh, the um, heavy fights that we had over the last year um, in legislative sessions. So um, we're happy to have all of you with us tonight. Drop your name, your school district, and how you um, are a, an, a public education supporter, whether you're a parent, an educator, um, an ally, uh, a student, um, you're more than welcome in this space. So feel free to drop that information into the chat and let us know who you are. Um, again, I'm Anthony Elmo, Texas AFT's political um, director, and we're really happy to have all of you with us tonight. We're going to get started probably in another minute or so. Um, I just dropped my own introduction in the chat. Um, I'm a Keller ISD uh, pa parent um, in the Fort Worth area, uh, in addition to being Texas AFT staff. So um, welcome all of you uh, for being part of uh, our Zoom tonight. I know we also have some political candidates with us tonight. Thank you for joining. Um, we're going to be joined by Aisha Davis as well, who has been a great State Board of Education member, um, very supportive of educators and public education in general. Um, and uh, who is also running for the legislature. Um, so we're excited to have her as a guest as well um, in a little bit. So we're going to get started in another minute or, or so. Um, please drop your name um, and introduction in the chat. We're happy to have you. Um, tell us your school district as well, and whether you're a parent, an educator, a grandparent. Um, thank you to all the grandparents that are with us. Um, we had great support from grandparents and support of public schools um, throughout the legislative session. So thank you all for being with us um, as well. Um, and many of the advocates that are in support of public education. Um, we also have retirees on. Thank you all for um, your service and for um, your continued advocacy um, on behalf of retirees. So thank you all. And we're going to get started in another 30 seconds or so. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, we appreciate all of you being with us tonight. We know folks are still joining, and that's okay. We'll we'll make sure to to greet them and thank them for being here as we go. Again, I'm Anthony Elmo, I'm Texas AFT's political director. Um, I'm going to be joined tonight by Nicole Hill, our communications director, and Patty Quincy, our director of public affairs um, and legislative council. Um, uh, in addition, to other AFT staff will be with us tonight. Um, and uh, we're very happy to have all of you uh, with us to talk about um, what's going on uh, in uh, our great state um, and the threats that are in front of us. Um, I want to kind of preview a little bit about why we're doing this. We're calling this series of Zooms Educating Texas um, because we all firmly believe that schools are the cornerstone of our democracy. Um, we believe that educators are citizen makers in, in a lot of ways where um, educators spend time uh, building up um, our young students to be the citizens uh, of the future that will guard our democracy and stand up for um, the the rights um, that we've all become accustomed to and fought for. And so we want to uh, acknowledge that. And we also want to learn about um, the levers of power and the um, relationship between politics and government here in Texas. 
um, and really try to to dig into that so that we can be successful in in uh, the political races that are in front of us and then in the next legislative session as well to get the change that we um, all believe in. Um, we think that union members and educators in general and the public education community are singularly placed to um, push back against what we see as an erosion of democratic norms and ideals, and that's a small d um, democracy. Um, this isn't necessarily about Republicans and Democrats. This is about um, norms and ideals that we all believe in um, to build a thriving Texas democracy, and that's what we're fighting for. Um, and our local neighborhood public schools are the middle of that. Um, you know, our campaign uh, over the next 18 months is going to be about building a more uh, successful, thriving Texas democracy so that educators, students, parents can all be successful in the system um, that is in front of us because right now the system is not working for us. Um, you know, we have uh, the ninth largest economy in the world. We have a, a large um, plural population, um, a diverse population, um, an incredibly intelligent, well-educated population. But for some reason, our public schools and our profession of educators um, is being starved for resources. Um, how did this happen and what can we do to fix it? And we we hope that talking about civics and talking about the levers of power in Texas can make some positive change in regards to that um, and help build a, a more successful, thriving um, Lone Star State. So that's what our goal is in this series. And we're going to do a series of Zooms uh, essentially every two weeks through the primary season and into the runoff season. Uh, as well, and even post-election through the spring, so that we can really understand the different pieces of the puzzle here. Um, tonight, we're focusing on the State Board of Education. Um, we're we're joined. We're going to be joined by a very special guest, Aisha Davis, who's been a wonderful member of the State Board. Um, so we're going to be happy to have her. And then over the next couple of weeks, um, we're going to be talking about SBEC, um, educator certification, what it means to to. Um, uh, engage with that um, governmental body. Um, we're going to be talking about voting um, and the barriers that exist in Texas to voting um, and the barriers we set in front of ourselves through non-participation um, in elections as well. Um, after the March 5th primary, we're going to do an election breakdown, talk about the races, talk about who won and lost and why and what it means for the levers of power. Um, we're going to talk about PACs and political money um, on April 2nd. That's one that folks should should circle um, as one that should be uh, particularly interesting and useful because money really dictates power in Texas in a lot of ways. We just saw this happen with Governor Abbott accepting a $6 million donation from one individual, um, the largest single donation ever in the history of Texas politics one of the biggest ever in, in American politics to an individual um, uh, governor. Um, and y you can imagine what six mil a $6 million donation does to um, our political process and our democracy. Theoretically, not something that George Washington would have envisioned um, and the rest of the founding fathers. So um, we're also going to talk about whether change is possible and how we can build a path to a thriving democracy for for educators and parents and students, um, and that's that's our game plan this spring. Um, and we hope you'll continue joining us and being part of these meetings. Um, we uh, very much hope that all of you will invite more people. Um, uh, our organizers are going to drop links in the chat to uh, please share on your social media and share it with your friends and colleagues. Um, and invite them to our future meetings so that we can kind of learn together and learn uh, about the levers of power in Texas and how we can change things for the better um, for our, our public schools. So um, one thing I definitely want to point to as well is that the 88th legislature and the special sessions that followed it are really catalyzed why we're doing this, because in many ways, those were lost sessions for public education. We didn't see the um, funding resources and the changes made to um, laws governing uh, working conditions to make education an attractive profession in Texas. And if our educators continue streaming out the door, our schools will perform more poorly and they will be um, charterized um, and turned eventually into privatized institutions 
um, that will lose um, the the flavor and the strength uh, of being built in the public square and in the public space. Um, and that's a major concern for us. And and we hope that you'll continue to participate in in these uh, these meetings with us and learn more. So um, let me turn it over to Nicole now, um, who is going to talk a little bit um, about uh, what our next steps are and what's in front of us tonight. Um, and also start with a pop quiz, because we want to know what folks know and think about the SBOE, about the State Board of Education now, um, and what what uh, what we can do to help you learn more about this particular um, lever of power and what it means for educators and education here in Texas. So let me turn it over to Nicole. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, as he said, I am Nicole Hill, the Communications Director for Texas AFT. Uh, I love working with educators for nights exactly like this. We advertised a civics education class and 170 of you showed up on Zoom uh, on a Tuesday night to spend your evening with us. So thank you so much. And to reward you, we have a little pop quiz. So if Marco, if you could launch the quiz... We have a few questions for each of you, uh, just to gauge how much you already know about those levers of power. So just four questions. Seeing the votes starting to come in. Ooh, question number four, going back and forth on the stats. This is very exciting. This is like watching election night. Looks like some people can't see the questions. Might they be in a different box? The questions are on the screen to answer a few folks in the chat um, who are asking where the questions are. If you're on your phone, it may be a little bit difficult to see the poll, um, but um, they should be on your screen. Um, there should, and if you scroll down, Irma, there's a, there's two or three more questions that you can engage with. All right, we've got 70% of folks participating. Uh, four questions. We'll give you a few more seconds to just jot your answers down. Um, if you can't see it on your screen, I do apologize. We'll go over the answers in just a second, um, so you won't miss anything. What if you don't know the answer to any of them? All right. I am going to end the poll. and share the results with each of you. So, question number one, who or what approves waivers to class size limits in Texas? Most, 62% said TEA, 25% uh, SBOE and 13% school boards. What is the right answer? Is it showing on your screen? Excellent. Question number two, who or what appoints the Texas Education Commissioner? Most of you got that one right. It is the governor. So Mike Morath is appointed directly by uh, Greg Abbott. Question number three, uh, we this was a multiple choice. So you could select all the functions that the legislature controls. Uh, so the correct answers on this are public school employee pay raises, which, if you're wondering, yes, is also a duty shared by local school boards. They take two different approaches to this, but the legislature does set school funding, and there is part of that dedicated to uh, employee pay raises. Legislature is also responsible for star requirements and also sets the class size ratio. And finally, true or false, members of the State Board for Educator Certification are elected. This was tight. 
5248, but the correct answer is false. Every member of the State Board for Educator Certification is appointed by the governor. Uh, so we'll talk more about that next week. But for right now, uh, we just wanted to do that quiz, gauge where all of you are at, um, and then talk a little bit about this very complex system of government we have in Texas. And there is a reason that not everybody got every single one of these questions right. And so for that, I am going to turn things over to Patty Quincy, who is the director of our public affairs department. Hi, good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. On this first slide, when we're going to start talking about uh, the power map, um, ooh, for some reason there's some drawings on here on the slides. Um, but anyway, um, we're going to get started with the Speaker of the House. And um, this is someone whose position is actually in the Texas Constitution. The Texas Constitution requires that the House elect a speaker for the House in the first day of the regular session. So every regular session um, will usually get a new speaker or sometimes they'll keep the speaker. Uh, for instance, Dade Phelan, who's there right now, this past regular session was his second regular session that he was elected to, but he also presides over the special sessions. Um, and there's a lot of important things that the speaker does and there's a lot of power there. Um, although um, we'll see in the next uh, slide, there's a little more on the other side. Um, because unlike the um, the lieutenant governor, the speaker is elected by House members. Now, because this is such a powerful position that essentially directs the House agenda, um, those who are hurt by him directing or not directing the proper agenda might um, attack him and some of the people who they'll call his lieutenants or you know his his right hand folks. And a good example of this is the voucher fight. During the voucher fight, um, the speaker didn't take a hard stance one way or the other. Now we considered that a good thing because we have expected, you know, with all the money and the push behind vouchers, we expected the speaker might be pushing this, but he decided that he wasn't gonna push it or hold it back until the very, very end. So um, he actually helped the public education community in the sense that he staved off that voucher fight uh, from getting to the floor for a while. And this ruffled some feathers, as you might imagine. The governor and lieutenant governor who really wanted uh, vouchers uh, were kind of ticked off. But then, uh, to make matters worse, the House then impeached the multiple indicted um, nasty um, attorney general Ken Paxton, who's, you know, just, you know, corruption has his picture right next to it. Um, so now what they're doing, because Dade Phelan was not, um, or Phelan was not doing the bidding of the governor and lieutenant governor, they're now actively campaigning against them. So for instance, right now, as we speak, Ken Paxton is in Mr. Uh, the Speaker's district right now, campaigning for his opponent. And this opponent is someone who's in the far, far right, very anti-LGBTQIA person who would be a terrible person to have as a replacement for this current speaker. But it just goes to show, you know, what kind of a mark the speaker has on his or her back um, when they don't do the bidding of the folks with money. So um, very important that you tune in for that April 2nd webinar because money has such a big role in all of this. Now, moving on to the next slide, we'll discuss um, our other folks who are elected positions. Um, the governor, of course, is elected to that four-year term um, unfortunately, we're stuck with him for four years at a time or multiple, multiple years like we had with Rick Perry. Uh, the lieutenant governor is also elected for a four-year term, and the lieutenant governor is often called um, kind of the most important or powerful elected position statewide in Texas. And why, you might ask, well, while the governor does have the ability to veto bills that get to his desk, the lieutenant governor can... <laughs> And basically, which bills come to the Senate floor. And this lieutenant governor rules with an iron fist. What he does every time we get another senator uh, on, elected on the Democratic side on the Senate, he'll adjust the rules. So instead of a two thirds rule, now we have like a five eighths rule. So we've got to have, oh, you know, just one more vote than the number of Democrats um, to require, require just to get a bill to the Senate floor. So that might be the best 
uh, legislation like paid parental leave for teachers that we had, that never saw the light of day because of the Lieutenant Governor. And this is really important because this is someone we can elect and unelect and has a lot of control over your profession. So he also appoints all the Senate committees, um, but the governor has a tremendous amount of power among our colleges and universities because he appoints the boards of regents for all of our universities. Those are the people that set tuition rates. I mean, they have a direct, direct effect on our students and how many students have access to affordable education. So two thirds of our board members overseeing our public universities are major, major Abbott donors. So, I mean, this is very much kind of a pay to play kind of a game, unfortunately. So this is why, again, it's so important to elect a governor because he also, or she also appoints the um, Board of Educator Certification, as we just learned, and also appoints the Commissioner of Education and the Commissioner of Higher Education. So again, these are uh, really important offices to the profession because they have direct control on what you do every single day. Um, and I'm so glad that we're gonna get to hear from uh, Aisha Davis in a few minutes because um, there's some really interesting folks that um, that the State Board of Education, who is elected, um, they get to deal with the SBEC folks. And some of them are very much in line with the governor's um, agenda and kind of whatever um, issue he wants to push, like kind of a trash um, um, certification test that really stinks. Um, you know, they'll put a lot of pressure on the State Board of Education, but fortunately the elected folks on there have seen better and have um, have thought better of some of the yes spec decisions. So thankfully we have that kind of a stop gap at the back, but um, just suffice it to say, there's a lot of power in these two um, individuals who are elected statewide. So this is why um, we really uh, try to find better <laughs> candidates than we've got on the ballot on the Republican side because we've been under Republican control for over 25 years almost or 20 yeah 24 years. So um, so that's why there's been just a bare a big shift from how we approach higher education, how accessible higher education is, how many grants we offer. Um, so it's very important that these statewide offices are filled with folks who are going to support uh, the education profession and uh, and students. And uh, let's move on to the next one. Now, our um, our folks in the Texas legislature, the House, they serve um, for two year terms and they have to run for their job or four year terms. It depends on the Senate folks. They, they run for four years unless there's a redistricting year, then what they do is they draw um, out of a lottery and they determine whether they stay for two or four years on the Senate side. So there's kind of a, um, a um, tiered system there. But um, but yeah, otherwise um, our friends meet for only 140 days, thank God. You know, there's other states that uh, are in AFT that tell us, you know, oh my goodness, that's not so much time to deal with it. Thank God, because if these people had any more time, like we saw with these multiple special sessions, they'll just come up with terrible ideas. Um, so we're just very thankful that it's only 140 days. And the thought there is that we would have a working legislature, meaning people who are real people who work real jobs and could come and um, or represent their uh, their communities, the legislature. But that's not the case, unfortunately, of course, because so much money is in politics it tends to be very wealthy people or very well connected people are the ones that tend to raise their hand to run for office, but it doesn't have to be that case. This is where you come in and we're gonna want you, the people who really know the public education issues firsthand, you're the ones who should be in these levers and in these in control of these powers. So um, our local school boards are incredibly important and you know this, I mean, these are the folks that set whether you get a bonus, not a bonus, a stipend, what your contract looks like, how many days off you get. But here's the thing. And they say, um, I think it was Tip O'Neill, former speaker, who said, all politics is local. This has never been true, truer now than ever. And that's because these big billion dollar donors from out of state are reaching down to the school board level and trying to elect the most far right people to ban books to make our schools look like they're grooming kids and just, you know, just the worst actors you could possibly get in these local levels of power. That's who the major donors are focusing on. So, 
now more than ever, we need folks to work and hustle for school board races. These are low turnout elections that have a tremendous amount of control over your very profession. So it's so important um, that we participate in those um, because of the amount of control they have. Um, so, so there's just so much control and you'll see, yeah, I mean, up, up to the governor, from the governor down to your local school board, there's so many other people that have control over your profession and that's not right. You know, you should be in these, in these positions of power. So let's move to the next one. And, uh, and this is kind of, you know, an important thing to remember is that once the legislature is over, it doesn't stop. Lawmaking happens constantly. In fact, it gets really busy at the State Board of Education and the State Board of Educators and the Educators, SBEC, SBOE and SBEC. They get really busy because they're the ones who have to write and implement all the bad ideas, or mostly bad ideas that were passed at the legislature. So that's one of the things um, that the State Board of Education has to deal with is a lot of this HB 900 book banning stuff. Um, when they talk about ethnic studies, you know, this... Um, kind of whitewashing that the legislature would like us to do our, to our textbooks, those are kind of the things that are coming before the state board, but also, again, at the local level at your local school boards. But um, the Board of Education is extremely important. Again, this is appointed by the governor, and we can submit people, and we have submitted many wonderful, very overly qualified people to serve in these positions, but the governor gets to choose. And um, and so he tends to choose people who are going to follow along with his agenda. Um, for example, Ed TPA, if you've heard of that, this really bad certification exam, he's pushing that. So he's going to pick and choose SBEC members who are going to push that. And sure enough, they do. They also review disciplinary cases. That is incredibly important. Um, this, these are the people that, you know, whenever you get any kind of a grievance, um, if it goes right up, you know, through the the um, the grievance procedure, it would ultimately come to SBEC. So these people could decide whether you keep your certificate, whether you get um, a public rebuke, or or whether you continue on and you are wrongly accused. So again, these are very important people, but they are appointed by that governor. Um, so and this leads me into uh, Kelsey's part, which. Kelsey um, is the person, uh, for better or for worse, has to deal with the State Board of Education um, and the State Board for Educator Certification. So she's become the expert on ethnic studies and all kinds of great curriculum and certification issues. And she comes from within the Texas Education Agency. So she's known all, all most of these board members and has dealt with all these issues for some time. So Kelsey, please take it away. Hi, everyone. Good evening. And it's absolutely my pleasure to represent you and Texas AFT at the State Board of Education. Um, so we have, um, yeah, I'll just give a little preview. So um, the board does meet five times a year and they um, go through their own um, process. We, we just sort of broadly call rulemaking. And that is um, where they set the um, processes by which they review and adopt um, instructional materials, um, the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, or ARTEKS, and um, everything is done um, through um, a pretty heftily um, governed process. Um, to, not tomorrow, thank goodness, whoo, um, but next week, um, the January meeting of the State Board of Education will commence, and we've just got a quick preview for you, um, and, and some of this could be um, uh, you know, some of it seems a little innocuous, but some of it has the potential to have some uh, ramifications, as Patty was just talking about. First on that agenda, um, one of the biggest pieces of legislation, if not the most costly piece that was passed um, in uh, the last legislative session related to education was House Bill 1605. And that is the bill that um, we uh, very uh, lovingly called it the Amplify Bill. Um, because that was the bill that, uh, among other things, overhauls the State Board of Education's um, review and adoption process. Um, the whole time uh, the legislature was saying it would give the board more power. Uh, we we maintain that it's actually taking um, uh, power away from the SBOE and giving more to um, Mike Morath and his staff at TEA uh, for reviewing uh, those materials. Um, secondly, 
We've got um, what should have been um, an item on the agenda was the Ethnic Studies, American Indian Native Studies courses. That agenda item we learned has been pulled um, because we have a new State Board of Education chair in Aaron Kinsey, and um, he's frankly given some pretty um, sad excuses for why that agenda item is not going to be um, on, on the uh, agenda next week. And uh, I was just on a call right before this uh, where uh, a group of advocates is gonna be working to um, uh, to get that back on the agenda, hopefully in April. Uh, we should have some more uh, calls to action related to that soon. Um, but proposed first reading of some career and technical education courses. Um, the board will be talking about their long range plan for public education and the Texas State Plan for the Gifted and Talented. I'm actually excited. Um, about that because we haven't looked at the gifted and talented education plan in over a decade. Um, so there'll, there'll be a lot of um, new uh, new and exciting ideas, I hope that will go into that document. Um, and then one other thing is possible action on changing rules for who is allowed to administer training to school boards. Um, that is something that the SBOE does have their hand in. And um, I, I think there's some will on the board to um, actually put some uh, stronger guardrails on the uh, folks who are able to offer that training throughout the state. So that's just a little bit. Um, uh, I am actually going to pop off. I actually just got a call from member Davis and she may have trouble logging on. Um, Y'all can bear with me for just a moment. Uh, Patty, would you I'll mind take taking this slide so sure. I can do this? Yeah, one of the Thanks. cool things about uh, the SBOE, <laughs> I use the term cool very loosely, is that they allow you to make comments about any of these controversial issues. And some of the best comments that we have seen have been from UT students, students that you know just walk a couple blocks down the street and testify, and university professors also. So when they talk about ethnic studies, and get into the nitty gritty about you know the HB 900 stuff that tries to whitewash um, our uh, curriculum and not talk about you know conflicting uh, history and stuff like that. Um, that's where you come in. I mean, you're the real educators. You have dealt with kids. They are under um, some kind of misconception that teachers are indoctrinating kids. But, you know, the way I hear a, a real teacher explain it is so simple. You know, all you do is present facts to kids and it's the kids who usually argue it out. It's not that you're telling them what to think. Um, so so these are the things they need to hear from the real experts. Um, remember who's talking to them right now. It's with their, with their checkbooks. So it's really difficult for them to believe some of this hogwash, you know, about uh, grooming and, and stuff like that when they look at, in the eyes of a real educator who can tell them firsthand, this is what we do and this is why we need an inclusive curriculum that reflects every child in my classroom. Um, so it's really important, um, you know, the same thing that we saw at the legislature, you are just the best advocate that we have. So to have you on our side and to be speaking truth to power about the certification issues too, and the certification test that is really crappy and is skewed um, towards minority applicants or away from minority applicants do very poorly on this standardized corporate test. So, so there's just so many things that affect your profession that you know better than any of us know. Um, you know, even though we spend a lot of time in that uh, so trans well, building nice. where the SBOE is, um, there's uh, there's just a lot more. Uh, stuff going on all the time so um, that you deal with that a lot of these people don't ever think about. So I just want to remind you that you are the real experts on education policy, but they, they I mean, when I say they, it's, you know, these appointed and elected folks often forget who the real experts are. So, um, so if you need um, to find a substitute and if you're able or to use a personal day to come down and testify. Anyone in the public can testify, and you can also submit written comments very, very easily. But the biggest impact is to go there in person and speak. And um, and sometimes it'll be people speaking and waiting until two in the morning. I know, you know, Kelsey has had some long, long, long days there before. But um, it's wonderful to see the amount of passion that people have for what our children are learning. Um, but it's important to remember that you, the public, have every much right. Uh, to have a say in what these people are doing. 
And, and I also would urge you to consider running for the board too in future cycles, because again, you are the real expert. You should be the ones in control, in power, making these decisions about your profession. Um, so yes, Mike Morath. Mike Morath has not ever been a professional teacher. I think he taught a computer class to adults or something and, and calls himself a former teacher. But, but this gentleman is, has no business being a commissioner of education. Um, we would never see a non-lawyer, you know, <laughs> presiding over the legal profession or a non-doctor or non-medical professional presiding over a medical association. Um, so, yeah, so that's really, um, we really need more educators in these positions of power. Um, and when we have more educators in power, our education system improves for everybody. Um, so, so uh, yeah, so we'll remind you of this too, as long as you follow our hotline, and this is another shout out for our legislative, our weekly hotline. Um, this goes out every Friday to about, um, to tens and tens of thousands of people. Staff members follow this, legislators follow this, uh, because we include all kinds of news from local all the way up to the national related to education and what's coming up. And you'll also get these previews on what's coming up in the next week for the SBOE or SBEC, where you can submit um, some comments. So stay tuned to that hotline. Um, Nicole, who leads our comms department, does a fantastic job of that um, publishing that weekly. So very important that you read the hotline regularly for calls to action. And uh, I think Kelsey's ready to take it back over. Kelsey. Yes, thank you, Patty. Appreciate you. I just want to make sure Member Davis could get on the call for us. Um, so uh, I guess it is my um, my uh, pleasure to make the introduction for our special guest. Is that where we are? Fantastic. All right. Well, um, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to um, Miss Aisha Davis. Um, Originally from Decatur, Mississippi, uh, Ms. Davis began her education career as a sixth grade reading and science teacher in Louisiana. Um, she later taught high school advanced sciences and engineering and coached robotics. I love that you did that. Um, she moved to Texas in 2011, where she worked in Irving and DeSoto ISDs. Okay, and this is a long list, bear with me. She holds a master's degree in, ed in ed administration science certification, ESL certification, and a principal certification, and is currently earning her doctorate in education leadership and policy at UNT. Okay. Ms. Davis was first elected to place 13 on SBOE in 2018 to, to represent parts of Dallas and Tarrant counties. Her current term expires in January 2027, but she has chosen to run for the Texas House this cycle, and she's going to talk more about that. So Ms. Davis serves on the Committee for Instruction and advocates passionately for equity and access in the curriculum standards, especially ethnic studies. And no one fights more fiercely against the expansion of charter schools um, than this beautiful person right here. So I just want to say it's been such a pleasure working with you since 2018, since you came on the board. And I will be equally as thrilled to work with you when you are a member of the Texas House. So please, Ms. Davis. Well, oh, thank you so much. And thank you for having me. I'm always thrilled to be, you know, amongst my people, amongst educators. So thank you so much for having me tonight um, and your kind words. Um, as my, as I, you know, was a teacher, I wanted to be an advocate for my students. I've always taught with the idea that I wanted to introduce information that students can use to improve their outcomes. And as I moved, um, into different fellowships and different opportunities to see how laws and policies and rules were made, I noticed it wasn't any teachers at the table. That's what really encouraged me to run for the State Board of Education as a science teacher in DeSoto ISD. Um, I was in a fellowship and went there to talk about science because they were about to remove some really important standards and teaks. Um, and so when I was there, I noticed there was no science teachers there. And I definitely wanted to be a voice at the table. Um, also noticed there were no black women there and that inspired me as well. So I um, would love to answer any questions that you have. Um, very excited as now running for the House of Representatives. It's been an awesome journey, but education has always been my priority. And one thing I'm so excited about is a lot of people, you know, make sure that they talk about how much they value a strong public education system. 
and the things that are going on and the things that I could possibly do at the Capitol. So it, it's been a, a great journey and just, you know, um, so excited to always have y'all as partners. You know, throughout this whole entire journey, I couldn't have done this without the teachers that have been working with me the entire way. And I appreciate that I can call y'all any time of the day, um, all, all time of night, on the weekends, to, to help me through this journey. So thank you so much for helping guide me to make good decisions for public schools. And, and we have a lot of more work to do. So very excited to answer any questions you have tonight. So yes, Ms. Davis has graciously um, said, uh, you know, she will answer some questions. So if y'all don't mind um, dropping everything in the chat, um, I'll just kind of keep a, a rolling, um, uh, uh, just kind of a rolling uh, list for you. Um, okay, first one from Brian. Do you think your sphere of influence will increase as a state rep? Great question. Absolutely. So the state board can only function in the scope of the law. And there are a lot of laws that are so flexible, they allow a lot of foolishness um, at the State Board of Education. Um, especially this last year, I've seen um, abuse of a lot of laws that aren't written well. And so they allow some things to happen that aren't the best for public schools. So making sure that the State Board of Education has um, a narrow scope in which they have to make decisions um, that will help with that process of, of doing good things for our standards, for our curriculum, for our textbooks. Um, so I, I definitely believe that I will have a lot of influence there um, at the Capitol. And one thing I'm excited about is working across the aisle. You know, it, it's as some of my colleagues, you would never believe some of the ones that are like, Aisha, you know, we can't wait to come to you with some things that need to change over here. So um, as Patty was saying earlier, yes, the commissioner, he's, I don't know how to politically say that the right way. She, but she, she, everything she said was spot on and has way too much authority on a lot of things and makes some decisions, not necessarily based on what's best for public schools. Um, a lot of those are politically motivated decisions. So making sure that there is some political, uh, some public say so, in decisions that he's making, um, those are some of the things that I want to prioritize doing at the at the Capitol um, to build a stronger public education system. Yeah, I think so. Unmute you myself. Heard. You need to do that. Um, can you speak yeah. to um, well, uh, uh, you know, something that's been on everybody's mind an awful lot since we had several special sessions on it is. Um, school choice and vouchers. Um, can you speak to the room a little bit about your thoughts and opinions on that? Yeah, so um, a little background about my experience with vouchers. It came before the State Board of Education November, 2021. Um, and we had a discussion when we were building our legislative, what, what 20, what, two, I think? Yeah, 22. And we were having the discussion on our legislative priorities and what we as a board want to make sure we stood for in the upcoming 2023 legislative session. And one of the things that we talked about is that we did not support vouchers. We wanted to make sure that public dollars went to public schools. And, and that was something that we unanimously talked about um, and supported. Then the board changed, the board changed. And we had some folks that came in and they had different types of influence. And we had some folks that had had some conversations and they started to change their mind on that decision. So one of the very first items that we had in 2023 was repeal of that legislative priority. And the state board no longer um, wholly supported public dollars going to public schools. But I have been vocal about that from the beginning. I, I don't support vouchers at all for several reasons, um, even beyond, first of all, we don't even, the way public schools are underfunded, I don't even know why we're having a conversation about any money going anywhere else. That's crazy to me. And we have plenty of school choice. We have school choice through our districts. We have school choice in all the charters that, you know, we have literally been adopting every year that I've been there. So saying that it's because of choice I, that's just kind of a political thing that they're saying it's, it's not about choice at all and at this point when you have 
when you have some power players who are, you know, primary and folks out of their seats and, you know, supporting folks just because they, you know, will go along with this one measure, that's kind of scary. Um, and it's, it's more than just support of kids. So I, I don't support vouchers. It's, it's a political thing. It, it won't help public schools in any way, shape, form, or fashion. The last thing I'll say about that is I, I think it was atrocious to have a surplus of money the way the state of Texas did and, and not put a dime toward significant pay raises for teachers. I, I think that was terrible on so many levels. And to hold that hostage for, you know, this, this voucher measure, that's just, again, showing that this is politically motivated. It's not about doing what's best for public schools at all. And I strongly support those legislators who have stood strong against these measures. Thank you. Um, there's so many good questions in the chat, but I think we maybe only have time for one more so we can get to our, our action. Um, but uh, feel free, Member Davis, to catch up in the chat. And if you want to type some responses, that'd be fantastic. Um, a question on everybody's mind uh, here at Texas CFT, you know, what are what are the SBOE members saying about the occupation of Houston ISD? And um, how, if possible, can the SBOE members help us to regain independent control of our district? So um, this, so we really don't agree on a lot of things as a board, but I will say the majority, the overwhelming majority of us don't agree with the takeover of Houston ISD. We, we don't like how there's very little accountability. We ask the commissioner for updates and don't receive them. Um, he's promised us things like he would, you know, give us information about what's going on there and we haven't received anything yet. So uh, we have a lot of concerns because if it can happen in Houston ISD, it can happen in any of our districts. So definitely we've been trying to figure out what authority we have over that process. And unfortunately, there is very little that the state board can do. And we did have a lot of powerful teachers come down and testify, express what's going on down there in Houston ISD, call the commissioner out for not being an active player, and the results from that are, aren't what I hoped. I hope that the commissioner would step up, have something to say and be proactive in what's going on down there. But unfortunately he hasn't done that. So it is up to us to make sure we consistently ask those questions that the teachers and the community has about what's going on down there at Houston ISD. But I can tell you, um, there are some legislators who at first thought it might be a good idea. They thought, okay, TEA can take it over and things will be a lot better. But now they're seeing that that's not the case what's going on there. And it may possibly encourage them to bring forward some legislation to make some changes to those bills that allow that. Um, and, you know, hopefully no other district has to go through what Houston ISD is going through currently. And I, I wanna share this as well. One thing that is kind of, I mean, it's really scary we asked what the timeline is for this takeover. And he has shared, there is no timeline. There is no markers, there are no indicators that maybe uh, you know Houston ISD community should take back control of the district. There is nothing that says you have to do this within an allotted period of time. That is scary. That allows them to essentially be there for you know whenever. So, so really, really tightening up those laws and rules that govern the ability to be able to do some of those things, it, it should be a priority this next legislative session. Thank you, Member Davis. And, and just to um, compound on what you said, you know, men, we have many, of course, chapters across the state, and many of those districts are teetering on the verge of where Houston was um, before that takeover. So, What's happening there should should be of concern uh, to everyone, and we should all be monitoring that um, very closely. Um, if you are willing to stay and answer a few more questions in the chat, I know um, our participants would just absolutely love to hear from you. There's so many great questions that we wish we had more time, but I think I need to kick it back over to our our goddess of organizing, Miss Jamie Vines. Thank you, Miss Aisha Davis. So happy that you were able to join us. Um, everybody, if you've learned 
anything in the last hour. It's that who we elect um, is super important. And I'm sure we all know that on this call. Um, but our deadline to register to vote is approaching. So we need to make sure that our friends and family and colleagues and everyone we love and who supports us in our jobs um, are registered to vote. And that's what our action is today. So let's see, Nicole, do you have the action slide? There we go. Awesome. So I'm going to drop a link in the chat to our relational organizing tool called Impactive. Um, I'm sure most of us have used this before, but we've got a friend-to-friend -friend action today that we're going to take. So the link is in the chat. If you open that link on your smartphone or if you have a tablet, whatever you use to send text messages regularly, um, you know, you're not going to be sending messages to strangers. Today, we're only texting our, our close personal contacts. So, um, I have the uh, the steps here, but I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen and walk us through it. But it's called a friend to friend action. Um, and the action is called voter registration check. There's a picture on the screen. If you're new to Impactive, you've never used it before, Marco just posted in the chat um, our campaign code. It's also on the screen. Uh, that'll take you to our Texas AFT dashboard. So while you guys get logged in, I'll go ahead and get my screen share going. All right, here we go. Okay, so um, the Impactive app uh, is right here on my screen. It's the bottom left icon with the double Vs and it's free to use, free to download. So our very first action up there, voter registration check, that's the one we're gonna be using. When I click on that, and I click start. And if you have any questions throughout this walkthrough, just put them in the chat. I promise I'll get to them, um, but yeah. So today we're gonna be sending text messages. So I'm gonna choose the text option. And at this point, if you've never done this before, it will say, do you wanna sync your contacts? So you can see I've already done that. Um, don't be afraid. All this does is just uh, put your personal contacts in the app, but only you can access them. Um, so none of us on the back end will be able to see any of your contacts. We won't be able to have your mom's phone number, none of that. So don't worry. And you can always um, unsync them later. But the point is, uh, we can see who um, who about our, out of our contacts can be matched to the voter file. Um, so the ones that have kind of like smiley faces next to them, those are people who vote often and they're reliable voters. Um, so you can see kind of who needs a little bit of nudging in your personal life to register to vote. Um, so if you're syncing your contacts for the first time, it'll just take maybe a minute or so. Uh, but once they're up there, you just go through your list and choose whoever you want to send this message to. Um, so I'm just going to choose a few here. Uh, just to show. But uh, there's no limit. So if you want to check all your friends registration, go for it. So I'll do get started. And so this is the text I'm sending. You can see the full script here in a second, but we do have English or Spanish. So whichever one you want, just uh, make sure it's selected and you'll press send. It's not actually going to send yet. But it will just pull up my um, regular text message thread with Abby, my friend, um, and this is the script. So you can edit this script as much as you need or want. Um, and if you chose the Spanish one, it'll show up as Spanish as well. And I just click send and then Impactive will open back up and it will go to the next contact that I selected. And I just keep doing that over and over again until I have no more chosen contacts. And that's how you send friend to friend messages. Um, I will say, you know, I hear a lot from people, you know, I vote all the time and nothing changes, but 
we actually have to win. We have to vote and we have to win these elections. So those people, it's not enough for just us to get out and vote. We have to urge uh, our friends and our family and get out the vote as well. So this is our first step really in uh, our campaign cycle. Okay, any questions I can answer? You can come off mute, you can put them in the chat. Oh, the name of the app, Impactive, yes. Um, if you do get a reply, and let's say they do need uh, help registering to vote, um, you can go to your inbox here, and if they reply, um, you'll see that. But um, we have this option that says follow up, and if they do need a registration link, we have the Secretary of State website here um, that you can send them. And uh, if you think that this person would like to join you, in our next campaign call, um, there's also a follow-up script as well, sending them the link to sign up. And that's how you do it. If anyone's having any trouble, just let me know and I will help you get in. So, um, this this action is going to stay up pretty much until the voter registration deadline passes. So um, if you meet someone new tomorrow um, and you want to send this to them, uh, it'll be up there. Or if you have friends who want to send this to their friends, anybody can join Impactive. They just need the campaign code. Oh, yeah, I see a question. What do the emojis like donkey and heart eyes mean? Yeah, in your contacts. So it does its best to match your contacts with the voter file. Um, and so the emojis indicate their level of like voter reliability, I guess. How often do they vote? If they're a super voter, they're probably gonna have these like heart eyes. Um, and some of them, if they're in Texas, um, it might show if they're registered Democrat or registered Republican to the best of its abilities. Now, of course, if you just have a contact that says mom and it doesn't actually have their real name, it's not gonna be able to match that with the voter file, but yeah. All right, I will throw it back to Patty and Nicole. Anything I'm forgetting? Um, thanks a lot, Jamie. Uh, really appreciate um, your fine training as always. Um, and thank you for all the participants with us tonight. Uh, we're so glad so many of you were able to join us and and hear from um, hopefully future state representative um, Aisha Davis. Um, and uh, in two weeks, we have another special guest and we hope you'll once again join us and please uh, invite others. Um, send our mobilized links to your colleagues and friends. Um, if they reply back to you tonight that they're registered to vote, um, tell them thank you. And that's great. And, um, join AFT on our next, uh, zoom meeting, um, on February 6th, where we're going to have state representative, Dr. Alma Allen, and we're going to talk about SBOE again a little bit. And we're also going to talk about SBEC, um, educator certification and what it means to be certified in Texas and how it's a distinctly political process. And that it isn't just about, whether or not you're qualified to teach or not, there's um, some distinctly political aspects to it that we need to know and learn about um, so that we can exercise those levers of power and try to change things um, for the better for educators. Um, and that's why we have great champions like um, Dr. Alma Allen and like Aisha Davis and so many other uh, great leaders. So um, please sign up for our next Zoom. Please be with us and share it with others. Um, if you are a member of one of our local unions in AFT, please share it with your uh, fellow union members. Um, please drop it on your uh, uh, union social media pages and your own personal social media pages as well for folks to participate and be with us. Um, and uh, if you can also drop the voter registration information as well. I'll make sure to drop that link in the chat real quick. There's a simple one to go to. It's called register2vote.org. Um, you can drop that link onto your social media as well um, so that folks take advantage of that um, and take a look at that website so they can check their registration and get registered ahead of 
um the uh the march 5th primary um that's coming up uh coming up quick so um thank you all for being with us we hope you feel better educated um now than you were a little over an hour ago about the levers of power in texas and how um we can affect change um and take back um this uh this thriving democracy we have here in texas and make it better and stronger for all of us so um we'll leave the chat we'll leave the zoom room open for a little bit longer just in case folks have questions about the texting. If you're still texting, that's great. Feel free to continue texting. Text your whole contact list um, and urge them to register um, and get out and vote um, in the next couple of uh, couple of weeks. So um, it's going to be a great opportunity um, for us to learn from each other on these Zooms. We have a great series um, and a great uh, uh, um, roster of guests that are going to be joining us as well um, that are both experts in the field. Uh, in their fields, people running for office, people that are in office, and people that have lost um, political races. And we're going to talk about what that means um, as well uh, for uh, for the future of democracy in Texas. So thank you all for being with us. And like I said, we'll leave the chat and the Zoom room open for a little bit. If folks have questions, um, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We can still try to answer them. Um, and if folks have questions on the texting uh, platform, we can answer those as well. So thank you.